In this video, we're going to be discussing the anatomy of the four muscles of mastication. Now, mastication is a fancy term for chewing, which is, of course, the rhythmic opening and closing of the mouth in order to mechanically digest food with your teeth prior to swallowing, right? But these muscles do more than just mastication. They're involved in speech. When you open your mouth to speak, these muscles are involved. When you open your mouth to yawn, these muscles are involved and everything in between. So understand they do more than just chewing, but we usually just term them the muscles of mastication. And there's four of them, the temporalis, the masseter, and then the medial pterygoids and the lateral pterygoids. The first muscle we're gonna discuss is the temporalis muscle, which you can see right here, whose muscle belly sits within the temporal fossa. That being said, its origin is the temporal fossa up to the inferior temporal line. So the fibers extend up here to what accounts for the superior border of the temporal fossa, and this is the inferior temporal line. And it also has attachments on the temporal fascia. Now this convergent muscle has fibers that narrow down to this white tendon right here, which then attaches on the coronoid process of the mandible, specifically the apex and the medial surface of the coronoid process. Now we can divide the muscle belly of temporalis into the anterior fibers and the posterior fibers because they have different actions when they contract bilaterally. So when the anterior fibers of temporalis contract on both the left and the right, so bilaterally, we get mandibular elevation. When the left and right posterior fibers of the temporalis contracts, we get mandibular retraction, which is sometimes called mandibular retrusion. But what happens if the temporalis only contracts on the left side, or it only contracts on the right side. Well, that's gonna produce ipsilateral lateral glide. In other words, if the left temporalis was to contract, but the right one did not, then the mandible would actually laterally slide or glide to the left. If the right temporalis contracted, we'd get right lateral glide of the mandible. Now, all four muscles of mastication are innervated by the same nerve, and that is the mandibular nerve. Also recall that cranial nerve five, or the trigeminal nerve, has three major nerve branches, and they're named V1, V2, and V3. V1 is the ophthalmic division, or ophthalmic nerve. V2 would be the maxillary division, or the maxillary nerve, and V3, which is the motor component, is the mandibular branch or the mandibular nerve. So when we say mandibular nerve, we're not talking about the branch of the facial nerve because there's also one coming off of that. We're talking about a major branch of the trigeminal nerve, okay? So the trigeminal nerve gives off the mandibular nerve and then little branches come off of that, which are the deep temporal branches. And those innervate the temporalis muscle. Blood supply to the temporalis is provided by deep temporal branches of the maxillary artery and also middle temporal branches of the superficial temporal artery. So let's get our little cheat sheet started here. So the anterior fibers of the temporalis are going to produce mandibular elevation and the posterior fibers of the temporalis are going to produce mandibular retrusion. And important note here, these posterior fibers of temporalis are the only muscles here that are gonna cause mandibular retrusion. The second muscle of mastication to discuss is the masseter. You can see the masseter down here, and you'll notice it's divided into two heads. There's the deep head right here, or the deep fibers, and then the superficial head, or the superficial fibers. If we look at the superficial part first, we see that it originates, first of all, right here, on the maxillary process of the zygomatic bone, and the remainder of it's on the inferior border of the anterior two-thirds of the zygomatic arch. The deep part originates off of the deep inferior surface of the posterior one-third of the zygomatic arch. Okay. Both of these heads have fibers that run inferiorly and really attach to the mandible all throughout this distribution right there where I'm tracing with my mouse. So they insert on the mandibular ramus, specifically its lateral surface, and also on the mandibular angle. And also know that some of the deep fibers radiate into the anterior capsule and the articular disc of the temporomandibular joint. We'll be looking at the anatomy of the TMJ in the next video.
Now for the action of the masseter. Both the deep and superficial fibers of the masseter will produce mandibular elevation and mandibular protrusion. However, by virtue that the deep fibers attach on that anterior articular capsule of the TMJ, they'll be able to stabilize the TMJ by placing tension on the articular capsule. Now the masseter, again, is innervated by the mandibular nerve of cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve V3. But coming off of the mandibular nerve, there's a masseteric nerve or a masseteric branch that goes out to provide motor innervation to the masseter. And the blood supply is via the masseteric artery. The masseter is going to produce mandibular elevation, and it's also going to produce mandibular protrusion. And now we're going to discuss the pterygoid muscles, and there's two sets of them. The first here in green is the lateral pterygoid muscles, and then the ones here in this red meaty color are the medial pterygoid muscles. And both sets of pterygoids lie within the infratemporal fossa, the anatomy of which we'll be discussing in another video. Now the lateral pterygoids here in green are divided into two heads. There's a superior and an inferior head. The origin of the superior head is going to be the sphenoid bone, and specifically it's the infratemporal crest of the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. Okay? And it runs posteriorly, as you can see here, and it's going to insert on the joint capsule of the temporomandibular joint and also on the articular disc. You can't really see the attachment on this articular disc here, but that's going to play a very important role specifically with mouth opening, so mandibular depression. Okay, We'll be talking about the biomechanics in a future video. The inferior head down here also originates off of the sphenoid bone, but specifically off of the lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid plate, which you can't see here in this image. Again, the fibers run posteriorly, and they're going to insert on the pterygoid fovea of the mandibular condyle. Okay. Now, when the lateral pterygoid muscles contract bilaterally, so left and right at the same time, we get mandibular protrusion and mandibular depression. Now, mandibular depression is when the mandible obviously moves downward, and this occurs during mouth opening. Really, gravity plays a huge role in this, and the only muscle that plays a role in mandibular depression is the lateral pterygoids. You'll note that the other muscles of mastication, if they're involved in either depression or elevation, they're actually going to favor mandibular elevation. This is the only mandibular depressor. Okay? And it also plays a role in stabilizing the mandibular condyle head during mouth closure. Now, if the lateral pterygoids contract unilaterally, so maybe they contract only on the left, then we get left lateral glide of the mandible, so ipsilateral lateral glide with unilateral contraction. Now, the lateral pterygoids are innervated by the mandibular nerve, of course, so a third branch of the trigeminal nerve, and coming off of that mandibular nerve is another smaller branch called the lateral pterygoid nerve. Okay? And the blood supply to the lateral pterygoids is provided by the pterygoid branch of the maxillary artery and also the ascending palatine branch of the facial artery. The lateral pterygoid superior head is going to produce mandibular depression and mandibular protrusion. And we can say the same thing for the inferior head of lateral pterygoid. Another important note here is that the lateral pterygoid muscle is the only muscle here that's involved in mandibular depression. Remember that gravity is also assisting with mandibular depression, but the only muscle involved is the lateral pterygoid. And then finally, we're going to discuss the medial pterygoid muscles. And the medial pterygoids are divided into deep fibers and superficial fibers, very similar to what we saw with the masseter. Now the superficial fibers are going to originate in part off of the maxillary tuberosity and then also not shown here off of the pyramidal process of the palatine bone. Then the deep fibers over here are going to originate off of the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate which is associated with the sphenoid bone, also not shown here. Both sets of fibers really just run inferiorly and they insert on the deep surface or the medial surface of the mandible. Okay? So more specifically, they insert on the medial surface of the mandibular ramus and also on the mandibular angle, which is down here. Okay?
Now again, when the medial pterygoids contract bilaterally, we get mandibular elevation and mandibular protrusion. Again, when they contract unilaterally, it produces ipsilateral lateral glide of the mandible. The medial pterygoids are innervated by the mandibular nerve of cranial nerve 5. This is starting to get old, right? And off of the mandibular nerve, there's a smaller branch, which is the medial pterygoid nerve, which, of course, innervates the medial pterygoids. And the blood supply is provided by pterygoid branches of the maxillary artery, the buccal artery, and the facial artery. The medial pterygoid superficial head is going to be involved in mandibular elevation and mandibular protrusion. And again, we can say the same thing for its deep head, mandibular elevation and protrusion. And so what you can see here is there's quite a few muscles involved in mandibular elevation and mandibular protrusion, but not very many involved in mandibular depression and mandibular retrusion. And so what you might expect, and it's actually true, is that the actions of elevation and protrusion are stronger and produce more force than that of retrusion and depression. And you can actually test this with manual muscle tests. You'll see that elevation and protrusion are stronger than depression and retrusion. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.